morning. It's good to see you all in church today. Glad that you're here. Uh, It's wonderful to have you in worship. Uh, If you're a guest with us, we're so glad that you're here this morning, and we would invite you to um, fill out the card that's there in the pew before you. Uh, Let us know how we can be in touch with you this week to share more about our congregation. We'd love the opportunity to, uh, to do that. Um, If you are a guest with us, uh, hopefully you'll uh, hear in just a few moments when we uh, introduce our time of communion at the table. Um, I want to let you know that you don't need to be a member of our church or of any church to come and to partake at the table. All you need to do is seek to um, draw near to Christ and have him draw near to you. And so I want you to know that uh, you're allowed and invited to come and to partake at the table with us uh, later in the service. If you've got prayer requests, we'd love to be in prayer with you as well. And um, that's on the opposite side of that card for uh, visitor or guest information is a place for prayer concerns. Uh, Please fill that out and let us know how we can pray with you. And uh, give those cards to our ushers in a few moments during the greeting time or after the service, and they'll be sure and get those to us. So we'd appreciate that. Um, Let's take a look at our um, insert and some of the things happening in the life of the church. I want to lift those up. I can't believe it's almost here, but the golf tournament is this coming Saturday in Crosby. You can see the Kids to Camp Classic is right there. It is a a great time in the life of the church. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Our Methodist men put it on every year and do just a great job uh, raising funds to give partial scholarships to uh, all the students who go to camp with us. Uh, They pay half and they pay for our adults, and they even help give us the transportation to get up there too. So they do so much to support us and help us out, and the community really responds greatly. So um, if you can be a part of that, or if if you're able to help out with that, talk to John Johnson after the service and let him know that you might be able to help out with it. Um, Just the same, keep it in your prayers, and um, there's opportunities to support and to play still, of course. Um, But uh, that's coming up this Saturday. Uh, down in, uh, in Crosby, uh, first thing in the morning. Uh, other things happening in the life of the church. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're having a vacation Bible school uh, meeting to kind of get a jump on some of the planning for that. Uh, it's going to be here in the fellowship hall, the building right behind this one. Um, we've looked at the theme and all that kind of stuff. We're going to do it the last week of uh, June this year in the evening, as we've been doing the last several years. That's been really successful for us. The theme this year is Hometown Nazareth, where Jesus was a kid. And so we're going to kind of have a Nazareth kind of experience uh, with our children, and uh, we're going to have a great time with that. So 2 o'clock, if you can be there this afternoon um, and are interested in helping out with Vacation Bible School, we'd appreciate that. Um, Tomorrow night is our admin council meeting. If you're a member of that, we need you to be there. So 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall uh, or in the disciples classroom there in the fellowship hall. We look forward to seeing you there. And then you can see we've got uh, Bible studies and youth and choir and confirmation class Wednesday and Bible study and Society of St. St. Stephen's on Thursday as well. So uh, take a look at those and uh, find where um, where you'd like to step in and, and be a part of what's happening. All right, at this time, let's stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. Find somebody you haven't met and let them know you're glad they're here today. Good morning. Please join in the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, 
for he is good. His love endures forever. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Please join in the opening prayer found in the bulletin. Awesome and gracious God, you are our God. We will exalt you above all else. In our worship today, remove any obstacle that hinders our praise. Give us a holy hunger for more of you. Strengthen us by the Spirit's power that we may grow in faithful devotion to you. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise can be found in your hymnal, number 327. Please join in singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. You may be seated. As you're doing so, I'd invite you to take the hymnals that are there before you and turn with me to page 12 uh, in the hymnal. As we prepare to um, come to the table later in the service, uh, we first off do so by hearing the invitation of Christ and offering our confession. Uh, to prepare our, our souls to come and to gather to this uh, sacred meal. And as we do so, as I said before, um, you don't need to be a member of our church or any church to come and partake at the table today. All you need to do is seek to respond to the invitation that Christ offers to all of us. And that invitation is this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us offer our personal prayers unto God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And as forgiven and reconciled children of God, let us be bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we come now to the time to dedicate our tithes and our offerings. Uh, we remember that um, you can make your offering to the church either through the box in the back uh, as you enter or leave at times of worship or um, online through our church giving link at our church website. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have provided to us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us generous hearts. Bless the tithes and offerings that we offer to you. Use them to build up your kingdom through the ministries and the work of our church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Children, come on down, it's your time. That's good. You know, today we're going to do uh, talk about something that's a kind of a big word. It's called reputation. Can you say that word? Ooh, y'all are y'all are awake. Okay. So, does anybody really know what reputation means? What do you think, Levi? hard to describe, isn't it? Well, you know what? I, th- I have a couple of pictures up here that I want you to look at, and it represents a, an animal, and I want you to describe that animal in one word, okay, when you see that picture. That's kind of what a reputation is. People look at you, and they judge you on what you say, what you do, and how you act. So, y'all ready? Let's play this little game. What is this first one? A donkey, that's right. And how would you describe a donkey? What do you think? It smells, okay. Yeah. Sometimes people think donkeys are stubborn. Hmm, okay. You ready for another one? Okay. What is this one? It's a pig. That's exactly right. What would you describe that pig? What would you say? Oh, he rolls around in mud. Yuck. Yeah, kind of sloppy, kind of dirty, right? Hmm. I don't know if all pigs are really rolling around in mud, but that's what we perceive, and that's their reputation, right? Okay, ready for another one? Here we go. What about this one? A tiger, that is correct. And what do you do or can you describe a tiger? What do you think? Levi? Well, they eat meat. They're majestic. They're soft and they can be fierce, right? They can poop, yes. (laughs) Yes, they can. Okay, last one, ready? What about this one? It is a teddy bear. And what do you think about a teddy bear? It's soft. It's cuddly, right? It could be huge. It could be small. Well, you know what? Even the Bible says as little as y'all are, y'all can have a reputation. And today we're going to talk about a guy. His name is Daniel. And when I think of Daniel, I immediately think, Daniel and the lion's den, but you know what? We're going to go before that. This was a story about what happened to Daniel before he went and was put in the lion's den. So I want you to put your listening ears on and listen, okay? So once there was a guy named Daniel, and my research says he was around maybe 17 years old or so. He wasn't that old. And he and some other guys got captured by the soldiers and were taking to another country, away from their house. And Daniel and these other guys were told that you need to forget about your God. You need to forget about everything you've ever learned. I want you to study for three years and learn the Babylonian ways. And in fact, I want you to learn 
about our gods, not that other God, okay? Well, Daniel knew that wasn't right. And so when they came and the king says, I want y'all to eat all the food and drink all the stuff that I eat and I drink, Daniel said, that's not right. That's not the way I was raised. And so he said, give me for 10 days just vegetables and water. And I don't know about that. And he says, 10 days, give me the 10-day test. And guess what? In 10 days, if I'm not more fit and more healthier than what all those other people are eating, that's the king's food and the king's drinks, well, guess what? Then I'll change. But he didn't change. He stood stood fast. And you know what? In 10 days, he was healthier than all those others that were eating the king's food and stuff. You know, he refused to eat, and it seems like that's just a very small little thing, but he trusted God. He refused to not let God go in his life, and because of that, he knew God would bless him. He followed God, and God did bless him, and because of that, Daniel became known as having a very strong and godly reputation. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So I want you to think, maybe we all need to be more like Daniel. I dare all of us to be more like Daniel and do the right thing, even when it's not easy, even when it's not popular. Will you remember that? Okay, I have something for you. You might, or I might not like it, but to remember Daniel, I've got some little veggies for y'all. Okay, but let's pray. (laughs) Yay, veggies, okay. Um, Let's pray, repeat after me. Dear Lord, help us to stand up for what is always right, even when it's not easy or popular. Help us to never forget you and help us to build good reputations. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, choir. Um, Really, really wonderful. John, amazing as usual, but my goodness. And uh, Jessica, I really like that reputation, but I do have a question. Do you have any dip to go with the carrots? No. No, all right. Well, that's all right. That's all right. They're good by themselves, just the same. Daniel did not have any ranch or blue cheese dressing, so that's a very good point. Boy, look, the preacher trying to kind of be squishy about the Bible, but I'm glad you're staying close to it. All right. Um, So, yes, our scripture reading is Daniel uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 21. Um, We're going to look for the next several weeks at the first six chapters of of Daniel. Um, Daniel is kind of a book where there's some mysterious kind of parts that are kind of hard to really project out. A lot of people have theories about how those work out as far as prophecy-wise, and we see some of those picked up in the book of Revelation. But there's some stories, uh, some of which you know very well, some of which you, you may remember, but we're going to kind of focus on, on some of those, on the stories of Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the next several weeks to look at how those fit together and uh, what they have to say, not only individually, but together uh, as, a, as a group of stories. So um, let's start with uh, Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Hear the word of God for you this day. Then the king ordered um, Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and their nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. 
He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those, were cho- among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name uh, Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, um, Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of this time, set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word made flesh in your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your word in the scriptures through which you reveal yourself to us. And we pray in these moments together that you would speak your word, that you would write your word upon our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit at work among us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, Abby and I were married in December of 2001. December of 2001, I was just finishing seminary that fall. I wrote my last paper. My roommate and I packed up the last of the belongings that were still in the apartment that hadn't already been either moved to my parents' house in Texas or up to her parents' house six hours north in uh, eastern Ohio. And um, we packed the last bit, crammed it into his tiny car, and we drove it up um, to Ohio so that I could get married a couple of days after that. Well, while we were there, um, I had family who made the trip up from Texas. My mom has, um, my mom is one of six children, and so her family were all packing up and getting up there and flying in to see this foreign land outside of Texas where I had gone and found myself a bride in Kentucky. Um, Well, the thing about the eastern part of Ohio, in particular Holmes County, where my in-laws live, is that Holmes County, believe it or not, is the highest concentration, the highest percentage population Amish County in America. It is uh, in East Ohio, it's not far from Western Pennsylvania, which is where we think about Amish folks in America being, really they live a lot of places, but that West Pennsylvania and East Ohio kind of area there has a lot of Amish folks and Holmes County, Ohio is about half the population is Amish. There's parts of the county you can go driving around and look around and realize you haven't seen a telephone wire in quite a while because they don't need them over there. So we're there for the rehearsal dinner. We uh, were getting things ready before going to the church and doing the rehearsal and coming back for the dinner. And on that Friday morning, my, um, my two youngest aunts um, and my youngest cousin who was with my youngest aunt. She was, my youngest cousin was probably about five or six years old at the time. And um, 
She was there. She was kind of a, a fun, precocious kid, still is, except she's an adult now. Um, but she was there and she was taking notes on everything and writing a story all about her adventure to get to come and to go on this trip and to go to uh, see this place and to go to the wedding. Well, we're there and we were having the um, rehearsal dinner uh, downstairs in one of the banquet kind of rooms uh, at an Amish restaurant, Amish style restaurant, which is just good stick to your ribs kind of stuff. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because you'll get hungry and have a hard time listening, but it's really good. Trust me. And, um, of course, a lot of the young women there who work there are Amish. They can work at the restaurant. Uh, even the ones who aren't might put on a little bonnet to kind of add to the flavor when people come in and maybe up their tips just a little bit. Um, but they're all there kind of dressed in their garb that they would expect. And so my young cousin slipped in to, was like kind of just looking around, saw them and went back to her mother and said, Mother, Mother. The pilgrims are just in the other room. It, she's never forgotten it. We won't let her forget it. It was just so cute and adorable. It was just lovely. And it kind of, you know, in many ways made the weekend for a lot of us. It was just really fun. The pilgrims are in the other room. Why did she think that? Well, we know why. We know why. We know why. Because the Amish folks have maintained a way of being distinctive no matter where they live. They have a, um, a peculiar look and you can, you can know it when you spot it, right? Um, they began, the Amish people, kind of the Amish group, kind of began in the late 1600s in Europe and ended up traveling across Europe and many coming to America in search of a place where they could continue to live in a peculiar kind of way to make sure that they remained holy unto the Lord. They're a Christian group of folks. And because of the choices that they, um, that they make as, kind of as, a, as a group, they have maintained a sense where when we see somebody who is Amish, if we, if we understand kind of what the look is like, we can pick them out because they have a peculiar look because they are a people who are a peculiar people unto the Lord. Now, peculiar. I didn't, mean, I didn't say weird. I just meant peculiar. Different. Distinctive, right? Well, you know that's what we're talking about when we talk about Daniel and his friends today and in the next several weeks, particularly today. Jessica, I really love how you talked about with the reputation and needing to stand apart that's what we want to look at. Um, that's what we want to look at today. If you take a sugar cube and drop it into a cup of coffee, what's going to happen? It's going to dissolve. If you put ice in your cold drink, what's going to happen? Eventually, it's going to dissolve. It'll keep things cool, but it's going to dissolve. You won't be able to tell the difference between it and what it's a part of anymore. Well, that's kind of the habit that people have is if we don't take special care and effort, we just dissolve into where we are and we look like and act like everybody who's around us. And that was exactly what Nebuchadnezzar planned on as his strategy in bringing the Israelites to work in his, uh, in his kingdom, to work uh, among them. When Babylon went and, um, and took over a country, it would do exactly that. It would take some of the, the young men who were sort of the best and brightest from the noble families, and they would take them and move them away from their land so they were already dis distant from their land. That's one thing that kind of helps them to be ready to dissolve. And then they would train them up in the service to the king. They'd have them eat like the king's people off of his table. They'd have them learn all the literature, all the culture, and all that kind of stuff. So that way they could blend in and they could take the best and brightest, so to speak, and put them in their service, but also um, kind of make them so dissolved into what it was like to be a Babylonian that they forgot that they were ever Israelites in the first place. In fact, that's what happened to the northern ten tribes of Israel is they just dissolved and intermarried into nothingness and they're completely lost to history because of that. But Daniel, Daniel had a sense something was up. He had a sense that there was a line that he did not need to cross. Because why? He was called to be holy unto the Lord. 
Holy is a word that sounds like it is a 25 cent church kind of word. And it kind of is. But holiness, if we'll stop to think about it, simply means remaining distinct, not dissolving. A holy people is a peculiar people, a people who retain their distinctiveness of who they are because of who their God is and who they serve and worship. That's what it means to be a holy people, a peculiar people. And that's what Daniel understood about himself and about his friends. So when they were put on this um, diet and education program for three years so that they would blend in and dissolve into becoming Babylonians, Daniel knew that there, was, um, there were some things that were out of his control and some things that he could do and other things that he needed to refrain from doing so that he could keep his distinctiveness. He knew he was going to do a lot of learning. He knew he was going to do a lot of study. But he saw the diet and saw there a place where he could remain distinct. Now, as scholars have looked at this passage, one of the things that they have uh, wondered about is, is it possible that he is refraining from the meat and from the wine and just having the vegetables and the water because the meat and the wine would have been offered in the temple to the gods of, Bab of Babylonia? And it's certainly true that that would be the case for the meat and for the wines. Um, so perhaps that's it. One scholar questioned whether or not um, Daniel abstained from that because that, was, um, the, that represented the wealth and the privilege of the Babylonian the, being in the household of the king where he knew that some of his people did not have it so good. They were among uh, the ones who were not chosen to be uh, re-educated and to be part of the king's service, but they were simply peasants in the land, or at best, and maybe slaves at worst. And Daniel, wanting to make sure that he maintained a connection to his people, said, I need to draw the line right here. I can't go eat and drink the privilege of the Babylonian kings while my people don't enjoy that. So I need to maintain a connection with my people. Perhaps that's it too. We're not exactly sure, but one way or another, Daniel saw a place where he needed to draw a line to keep himself distinct and to prevent himself from dissolving into um, the Babylonian culture and ways. Well, it's not hard to hear uh, the application for us, is it? The people of God always, always live in a foreign land. The people of God always live in a foreign land. One of the, um, there was a book that was written 25 or 30 years ago at this point called Resident Aliens. And it was talking about the notion that wherever the people of God are, there's a culture that is not there to represent or to hold up their values. They always have to maintain within the Christian community, within their houses of worship, within their discipleship, their holiness, their being peculiar, being different unto their God. Now, how do we do that? What are the ways that kind of practically apply in our life? Well, I think um, it's very simple in that it, it's kind of two. One is in our habits and the other is in our ethics and our moral choices, right? Those are our two things, our habits and our ethics. That's where we find that distinctiveness. In, in our habits, um, how we live, gathering for worship, um, having devotions, paying attention to grow in our discipleship, paying attention to serve within our church or to serve uh, in our community in, out of a distinct Christian witness. All those are, are simple but intentional ways that we have that continue to help shape us and make us who we are. There's a saying I read recently in a book about, um, about the wisdom of, of the Sabbath and Sabbath keeping uh, as a pattern for rest and renewal just for, uh, for the Christian life. And it talked about for Israel, it said that there was a saying among the nation that Israel didn't keep the Sabbath. Sabbath kept Israel. Do you hear the difference? The Israelite people didn't keep the Sabbath so much as the Sabbath kept 
them. It was a habit and a practice that reminded them that they were distinct, that there was one day a week for them that was off limits. And they were to worship, to rest, to play, but they were not to work and be productive just like all the other days. And in doing that pattern and keeping that rhythm, it reminded them it was like an object lesson. It wasn't just good for them, which it was and is for us too. It was also an object lesson that kept in their mind, we're different lest we forget. You know, in the year 2000, um, somebody was on a radio show and they made, uh, in Austin, Texas, and they made a, a point about all the um, local oddities of Austin and of its food and culture and things like that. And uh, they were really interested in maintaining that. And so they said something on the radio that someone else, of course, um, took and copyrighted and then profited off of. Um, Keep Austin weird. You've seen t-shirts, you've seen bumper stickers, you've seen all the stuff, right? Well, somebody, they had a passion for the local strangeness of Austin, and they said, we need to keep Austin weird. But somewhere, there was a capitalist who heard it, and they said, we can put that on a t-shirt, baby. Uh, and that's why we all know about it, right? But, you know, the original impulse was, hey, there's something really unique and special and valuable about this being unique. So let's not lose it, right? Right? Let's not lose it. Folks, Christianity is weird. Being a Christian is weird. Being a Christian is weird. We have different standards for marriage and sexuality. We have different standards for how we look at money and what we're supposed to use it on and how we're supposed to do that. We have different standards for how we use our time. We have different standards for what we're supposed to do when we have um, authority or power in some situations. We have different standards for how we're to do family life. All those kinds of things. Christianity is weird, but you know, weirder than that stuff are the things that we believe about Jesus. Because we believe that Jesus was God made human. Who believes that kind of thing except weird people like us? We believe that Jesus died for the sin of the whole world, which could be a novel idea if we left it at that, but we believe that Jesus raised up out of the grave three days later and is alive again and offers that life to us. You know what? I'm sympathetic when I hear of other faiths and religions who have weird beliefs because I'm like, you know what? I don't believe that but I understand that because I believe that a man who was God came and lived on earth and died and then raised to life again. That's a weird belief. Not everybody can get their minds around that. But it's okay because we need to keep Christianity weird. And we do that with our habits, with the habits of our life, the rhythms of our life that keep us remembering and nurturing and reinforcing and learning and growing in who we are and who we're called to be, not just in our beliefs and in our affections for God and an affinity for God, but for a life that is lived out for Him, practically speaking, in the way that we have standards that are set for us, in the way that we live. Our habits our ethics are the things that remind us and keep us peculiar people, holy unto the Lord. Daniel um, had um, that challenge on his doorstep about um, dissolving into the culture. And he knew he couldn't change everything about the culture, and so he didn't go and say, and I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up for, the, for people who need to be stood up for, but here in Daniel's case, what happened? He couldn't change what the king was going to offer to people, to the other folks, but he could change if he would participate in that or not. He couldn't change whether or not he was in the program. It was either that or be, a, um, be thrown out into be a peasant or a slave or executed because he was someone with some promise who didn't want to go around with the situation, go along with it. So what did he do? He said, I can find this. Tell you what, I'm not going to eat from the king's table 
And of course, the man is nervous because there's a risk in that. And he says, well, just trust me. Well, he trusted the Lord and the Lord provided for him. The Lord came through. In his book, The Gospel According to Daniel, um, Brian Chappelle tells a story about uh, a couple who had moved to seminary. The, the man was enrolling in classes, and so his wife was, uh, was uh, working to support the family during that time. And she worked with a pharmaceutical company uh, where she um, was the person who um, kind of was the safety and quality control on syringes as they, uh, as they um, produced those and then shipped them, shipped them out. And so she was the one who, um, by law, by federal law, had to sign off on whether or not they were approved, uh, sanitary and approved, to be sent out for use. And so um, there was a shipment that was running late for um, some uh, reasons with the factory that, it, that had been producing them, and she didn't have time to, um, to check off of them before they go, and, her, and her, her supervisor pressed her to just go ahead and sign off and let them go, even though she hadn't been able to check them. He said, listen, we hardly ever have any issues with that anyway. We are on a deadline. We're going to lose this account. Um, we've got to get these out here. But, you know, she looked at it and she thought, you know, I'm our only income. Um, this is our livelihood. It's probably true that this batch is okay, but I can't do that. And it was a huge risk to take, but she held her ground knowing that she probably could get fired over it, and she didn't sign off. Well, as it turned out, she did get fired for it. But the rest of the story was that the business on the other end that was about to receive it inquired as to why the shipment was delayed so much. And somehow or another unearthed that it was because she was reluctant and wouldn't sign off on them. And when they found that out, they appreciated her integrity so much that they called her up and offered her a job at a raise. The Lord doth provide. Daniel said, I can't eat from the king's table. It's not right either because it's a sacrifice to idols or because uh, it helps me just forget about the plight of my people. One way or another, I can't do that. That's, a line, that's one line I cannot cross. But the Lord provided. And as a result, here's the other thing that I can't help but wonder. I can't help but wonder as we go through these weeks and as we see more stories of Daniel and more stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I can't help but wonder if it's Daniel's integrity in that moment and his courage to, to draw a line and say, no, I have to remain holy to the Lord. I have to remain peculiar, weird for my God. I have to wonder if his witness in that moment is what gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the courage later to take a similar stand. When you and I guard our own peculiarity, in the midst of our setting and surroundings. There's a risk to it, but there's a reward too. There's a reward because we've done something that is honoring to God, but that also strengthens and steals us up and prepares us for greater challenges. And it can be a mighty witness for someone else. who All they need to see to be able to steal up and stand for themselves is to know that someone else has already done that as well. So, you can't control everything. Sometimes there's places where we um, participate in the culture around us and we're not compromising our identity or our morals or things like that. Daniel went through the program, but he found the one place where he's like, but if I give this up, I've given up something essential. Where's a thing that you need to draw a line on this week? Where's a place that you need to make sure you just don't fudge and don't move off of? Because it's, not, it's a compromise in a way that other things just aren't. How is it that you need to take an action to make sure that you are distinct and don't dissolve this week? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, um, we are, whew, well, we're challenged by Daniel's courage and integrity.
but we're also inspired by it. Lord, help us to see, um, to see in our own lives and to see around us just the landscape so that we might not dissolve into the culture um, around us, but that we might remain a peculiar people, a holy people for you. And Lord, we pray that you will um, bless us as we do so, that we may be a powerful, positive, winsome witness for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd ask you to turn again with me um, to page 13 in your uh, bulletin. As we continue to prepare to gather at the Lord's table this day, at the great Thanksgiving, partway down page um, 13, would you join with me? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, likewise, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would those assisting in serving communion come forward at this time?
Table is set. Would you come at the direction of the ushers following the choir? You have received from the table of grace. Go to be a people of grace in Christ's name. Amen. Through Christ we have peace with God. Go forward to be peacemakers in his name. Amen. Praise be to God, we are born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Go forward to be a people of hope in his name. Amen.
you have received the grace of God in Jesus Christ, go forward to be a people of grace in his name. Amen. you turn to the back side of your bulletins and join uh, together as we pray the prayer after receiving communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing our closing hymn. Our hymn of commitment is in your hymnal, number 614. Let's sing the first and last verses of For the Bread Which You Have Broken. I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Go forth with this blessing and benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit at work within you. Go in the peace, the power, and the presence of Christ to be his witnesses. Amen.